So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. So whereas we've always thought that within nature there was a lot of chaos, that in discovering this new fractal geometry, and what, what does fractal mean now? Let's get the definition of fractal or get an idea of what that is. Why fractal? Fractal comes from the word fraction, if you think of fraction. It's some kind of a fraction between dimensions. So apparently this fractal geometry is a geometry that is between dimensions and is a geometry that explains everything in nature, trees and water and clouds and, and actually, you know, the order according to which the, the body works, all the different systems in the body work that way, all the systems in nature reflect this, express this. So through this new geometry, a deep understanding of nature's order is emerging. And this new view, this new understanding is changing the interpretation of nature. It's changing our inter interpretation from one that thinks that there is a lot of disorder and chaos into one that sees that there is order everywhere and that that order only needs to be understood. It's really too much to go into, but you will recall from our other classes that it is all to do with pattern, with reiteration, with pattern across scale. There is, for instance, you know that Mandelbrot set. If I mention the Mandelbrot set, would you know what I'm talking about? Are you familiar? <laughs> Are you familiar with the Mandelbrot set? Don't worry about it. That actually is one of the basic fractal sets. There, there are several very basic sets in this fractal geometry, and the Mandelbrot set is, a, is probably the most famous of the geometrical sets. This Mandelbrot set is something that has come forth from a, a basic equation. In other words, they have discovered a, the basic equations in nature, what make nature, what makes nature take the forms that it takes. Mm -hmm. And so you have an equation, and when you put this equation into the computer and you reiterate it, and you have the computer reiterate it, in other words, repeat it, keep on feeding it in, feeding it back on itself. It's a, like a cybernetic function or activity that the, the equation is fed back on itself and is, is caused really to go on infinitely. It will go on infinitely if you allow it to or what mathematicians refer to as infinitely. And what happens is the, this exquisite pattern comes forth. And the pattern is really one of self-sameness and self-similarity. And so you see that out of the infinite self-sameness of that equation, so you're feeding in the same equation, the same equation, the same equation, and out of that self-sameness from an equation that never changes, see it never changes, comes this complete and total expression of self-symmetry. 
within the self-sameness is this self-symmetry and within the self-symmetry further is the unending variety of this self-symmetry and that variety is the self-similarity so that you have a pattern that repeats itself and repeats itself and then it will repeat itself within itself and as it repeats itself within itself it repeats itself to be self similar close to but not exactly the same it reminds me very much of of absolute christian science where you, every idea is an instance of self similarity it's self similar to its origin it is self similar no how am i going to say that you see within the one idea which we would see is equivalent to what we know in divine science where you have that soul related to its own idea as a whole and you have that self symmetry between soul and soul's ideas being the relationship when that is expressed at a further level where soul would relate itself to each idea you see to the individual ideas of soul those ideas would have self similarity and all of that self similarity all that infinite variety of self similarity is embraced and held within and contained within the self symmetry of soul and soul's idea does that that make sense and so in this mandelbrot set and i i know that some of you are familiar with it others may not be but if you ever have the opportunity to look into a say a book on self similarity or to watch one of these very wonderful presentations that you get on PBS or on one of the public broadcasting stations you will certainly be exposed to this very fundamental mandelbrot set that that is an exquisite example of these relationships that soul has to soul's idea and to to the infinite variety of the ideas of soul remember that symmetry is balance it means a balance and if you think of that which is beautiful it will always have this quality of balance it need not be symmetrical you know it may not be that sense of symmetrical in the sense of having a dividing line you know so often we say something is symmetrical if there is a dividing line with two sides and that each side is uh, in in balance you have that say with the with the human body or you have it with the human face that you would consider that the the face is symmetrical the body is symmetrical you have two hands two arms two legs two feet and so it doesn't mean that term does not necessarily have to apply to that sense of uh, symmetry where you have a dividing line and two two different sides uh, one on each side of that line no. okay yeah you can also have you see an asymmetry you can have an asymmetry where you don't have two sides that are perfectly in balance with each other but soul has to do with symmetry itself with balance itself with the perfection of balance just just look back you know you can always take what you already have what we already have so if i say well okay what do i already have i have already seen the the whole of mind the whole of spirit mind and minds of ideas spirit and spirit's ideas look back at that everything that we've seen about mind and about spirit there's perfect symmetry there perfect balance there you have balance from level to level to level 
You have balance all the way through the four, the calculus four. It's, it's the fact that nothing is off there. There's nothing off. There's uh, no incongruity, no disproportion, you see. So it has a lot to do with proportion. We could say that that symmetry is proportion and everything is in proportion. These are the elements of beauty, aren't they? This is what makes something beautiful to us and why I'm always saying every four or five sentences I say, isn't that beautiful, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and it's because one feels that, that balance, that symmetry, the beauty of the proportion of being, of everything being in proportion. Nothing is out of balance. And so in looking at mind and spirit as we have taken them, absolutely nothing is out of balance there. Soul has all to do with what is beautiful by spiritual definition and according to spiritual sense. And it has everything to do with keeping that, with maintaining that, you see with rendering that identity unchangeable, untouchable. So now what does soul as the Christ tell us? What does soul as the Christ tell us about that relationship of soul to its infinite idea? It says that in its own realm now, that self-symmetry, that balance, as the Christ shows itself forth as being inviolable. The Christ expresses that idea of soul as inviolability. It's an inviolable realm, an inviolable creation. So the whole creation, soul says, is intact, intact, untouchable. You see, that's coming out of the unchangeability, the unchangingness, the sinlessness of soul itself on the level of science itself. And now, in respect to having an idea, soul says, my idea is intact. It's untouchable, immutable. So here again, we have several terms that seem to be adapted to the human, the human perception of that idea and that relationship of soul to soul's idea, soul to soul's creation, that it can't be touched, it can't be violated, it can't be rendered mutable, all coming out of the unchangeability that we saw in soul as the Christ in science itself. It's the office of the Christ, then, that takes care of this. The Christ that assures that this is the case and that it's always the case, that the Word, soul as the Word, is always expressed as what it is. So you get the integrity there in a, a great sense, the integrity of creator and creation, ever remaining one, ever remaining one in quality and quantity, if we could say so. Now, when we come to Christianity in divine science, Christianity will show us something about the all-embracing sense, the all-in-all -all sense of being. Do you remember that from that particular point of intersection in the design of being at the point of Christianity and divine science. It is really epitomized by that capitalized term, love. It's the one love. And we can remind ourselves, too, that at the point of Christianity, there's always a self-fulfillment, you see, in divine science. The outcome of the Word and the Christ is the self-fulfillment of Christianity. We get that as the output, as the outcome. 
sense it is divine science, and divine science itself has to do with the all-embracing sense, sense of the all-in-allness of soul and soul's idea. These ideas now that we see here should reflect that tonality in some measure, some measure. So soul, in that tonality, is seen to be the infinite capacity. And you see that? What did we just say about that standpoint of love as being the all-embracing, as holding, containing, you see, the all-in-allness of being? It's from soul standpoint, then, the infinite capacity of soul, the ability of soul to hold, to contain its infinite idea of itself. Do you hear that all-embracing sense? To contain something Mm -hmm. in a capacity, to hold something in a capacity, this is what love would call all-embracing, to embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. That the all holds the all within itself. So soul holds the allness of soul within itself. And this is the infinite capacity of soul. The ability of soul to contain the absolute infinite fullness of its idea, its own self-expression. And we can see that this is the fact that soul is unlimited, unlimited, and that it is never in anything, never in anything. So that capacity is a divine capacity. It isn't in something as we would think of it from the human standpoint. It's a divine capacity for soul to to be what it is, for soul to be the identity of being in every conceivable expression of that. is one infinite expression of that identity of being. And that is never in anything. You see, even these two terms, withinness and capacity, are like two different aspects of that that infinite sense, but an infinite sense that is never contained in anything material or mortal or human. And this will be a tremendous impact for us as we come to the level of Christian science. We're going to see what the ramifications, the implications are of this divine fact of being. So finally, we come to the standpoint of science, in divine science. And we know now that there we have that place value which is epitomized as the divine principle, love, in terms of capitalized terms, and which has all to do with the divine self-understanding of being. Science as that one principle love, saying, this is how I understand myself. And so if we ask a question about soul, we ask the question from soul standpoint, we're going to see something about how soul understands itself, how it understands itself really scientifically as it looks back on itself through the word and the Christ, and Christianity. That soul understands itself really as the identity principle of everything. You recall that at this particular point in the design of being, we have taken those aspects from the world that show the impact on the world of the synonymous term, synonymous term in relationship to the universe, how it is perceived, 
how it is being perceived by our universe, our world. And so what did we have in mind? We had the information principle, how the world is becoming aware that there is something informing it, something above the material, above the concept of, of subject and object, that it is a principle, it's impersonal, it has no human personal connotation to it, that, that something is standing above the universe and informing the universe, and that from the standpoint of spirit, something is standing above the universe and is ordering it. And now something is standing above this beautiful universe and is identifying everything, is bringing out the whole issue of identity, the identity of everything. And so what is perceived in the world today as soul is called an identity principle. And it comes into all the disciplines, all the sciences, in various ways, in ways that are adapted to those, those sciences and those disciplines and those, those scientists, especially those scientists that are on the cutting edge, that are open, that want to see something new, that are not closing down and clinging to old standpoints and old paradigms, but but to the openness of the true scientists and the new scientists, to that openness, the synonymous terms are breaking in, and soul breaks in, and it brings and raises up the awareness of an identity principle in everything. And if we had time to take the examples from our universe and, and the disciplines in our universe, we would see that perfectly. So that nothing is going on except the operation of an identity principle which is divine. It's above the human, you see. You don't find it in the human, the, the origin of it, the source of it. It's, it's above the human because it is divine. And wherein, you see, an identity principle wherein subject and object are seen to be one, are explained to be one. And this is coming out everywhere, this understanding of subject and object being one, even in, in the physics, uh, John Wheeler, I think it is, that speaks about the universe. He, they draw a picture of the universe like, as a great eye, uh, an eye, you know, E-Y-E, -E, looking back on itself. You see, looking at itself, mm -hmm. this sense of subject and object being one, and that's why there's coming up this this point coming up of it being a par participatory universe, that the universe participates mm -hmm. in its own evolution, that it it is self-aware, it is aware of itself, it knows itself. It's a self-conscious identity. You see, that's the really part of the meaning of the, of the ego, to be a self-conscious identity. So they would even describe the whole universe from a very new standpoint in, in physics as a self-participatory universe. And this is all to do with subject and object being one. So soul says that and is rendering that to be the fact and the form of every conscious consciousness. And all expresses in this, in this universe, in this realm, in this creation of soul, everything expresses the divine rule of soul. So we come to the rule of soul. And if you look back to mind, you see that we had the law of mind. And in spirit, the order of spirit. And now in soul, it is the rule of soul. These are 
uh, terms really that belong to what John Dorley would call the scientific tools of being. And they're the first three great scientific tools. You, you recall from his work that he could see the seven, the seven synonymous terms in terms of seven scientific tools, law, order, rule, system, method, form, and plan, or design. So it's the, the law of mind, the order of spirit, the rule of soul, the system of principle, the method of life, the form or gestalt of truth, the plan or design of love. That these are the tools of science. And so we find them in the present layout here in the design of being at the point of science in divine science. That the whole realm of soul expresses or shows forth the rule of soul, how soul governs its realm, how it governs in relationship to its idea. The governing of the realm of soul. And when you look into the deep meaning of the place value of science in divine science, you know it's all to do not only with the divine self-understanding, but with divine self-government at that point, which is so exact to what we are seeing here, that how does soul govern? It governs through the rule of soul. So these things, so many of these things that we all thought of as isolated, as rather isolated points of information and understanding within the science of being, I think now begin to find their place value within the whole framework of the 7,000 year period and that everything is now becoming integrated, that we see how everything relates to everything else, how it is integrated into a whole design of being that, that makes sense. It makes divine sense and it consequently makes sense to us even at the point of our human understanding of the divine.